Thank you, Jesus. Just take a moment to come into his presence. It says we come in with our thanksgiving. Just want everyone to close your eyes for a moment. We'll have plenty of time to fellowship at the end of service. So right now, let's just put our attention on the Father. Just as you're standing there with your eyes closed and maybe your hands out, just begin to thank Him this morning. Just begin to pour out your thanksgiving to Him for anything that comes to your mind. So Father, we just thank You for Your love and for Your grace. We thank You that You are the perfect Father, that You are the perfect King. Lord, that You have a purpose and a plan for us. Thank you that you take such good care of us. with your heart this morning. Thank you, Father, for the privilege to worship together with this body of believers. Thank you for the privilege to lift our voice, to lift our hands and worship you. We choose to lift you up today, Father, to exalt you because you are worthy. You are worthy, Lord, of all our praise. You are worthy of everything we can give. You are worthy of all the honor we can pour out to you, Jesus. We will not be silent today, Father, as we worship you, as we lift up our hearts to you, as we lift up our voices to you. Let's just give him some praise this morning. Hallelujah.
Last week, you guys remember firm foundation from last week? Let's try this spot. He won't fail. He won't fail. So you get to dig into some of those bass notes. All right, let's try that again all together. He won't fail. He won't fail. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. 
Father, that you're always right there. Holy Spirit, we can turn to you. Thank you that you came to set the captives free. Thank you, Father. We just stand in the gap this morning for those who need you. Those who need breakthrough in their lives, we stand in the gap for them this morning. We declare victory. We declare breakthrough in Jesus' name. Sing this from the bottom of your heart today. i 
when I cannot stand all Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand out for you, Jesus, you're my hope and Good morning and welcome to Fusion. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, we're really glad that you're here. In case you didn't know, we have youth nights every Thursday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Some weeks we have teaching nights and some weeks are volleyball nights, but every Thursday evening is youth night here at Fusion. If you're youth age, that's 13 through 19. Come on out and join us for youth. We always have a good time together. The Hand in Hand Exo Marriage Conference is coming up. It's going to be happening here Friday through Sunday, May 13th through 15th. Saturday, May 21st, and Sunday, May 22nd. There's going to be food included in the conference, and there's going to be speaker Jimmy Evans and plenty more. You can sign up at the early bird price of $30 if you sign up before May 8th. There's a sign-up sheet in the back if you want to sign up today. It's a great idea. The door price will be $40. Invite your neighbors and friends out. It's going to be an awesome marriage conference. A marriage does not begin with paying bills and raising kids and mowing yards. A marriage begins with two people in love, and it's all about you. It's all about you, too. It's all about the relationship. But somewhere along the line, we forget the reason, and it becomes dutiful distraction. Our relationship with Jesus began as a relationship with Jesus. It wasn't about reading our Bible or going to church or tithing or teaching Sunday school. It was a relationship with the God of the universe who saved our soul from hell. And it was a passionate relationship. And Jesus said, that is the engine. And I will not allow that engine to burn out. That is the main thing. And I will not allow the main thing to become secondary. When we lose our first love, not only are we a bad advertisement for a great God, but everything bad begins at that happen. Everything bad in a marriage, it doesn't begin when you file for divorce. It begins when you lose your first love. The conference is going to be hosted by Lawrence and Susie Duick and Walter and Betty Thiessen. It's going to start at 7 o'clock p.m. Make sure you sign up for the Exo Marriage Conference today. That's all of our announcements. Thanks so much for joining us today. Enjoy the service.
because we know that you also speak into them, Father. So I ask you to help uh, every one of the teachers and everybody that is involved in it that they may know you today, that they may have an encounter with you, and that your glory uh, will be known in our lives and in this city and in this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, children are dismissed. So, we are going to uh, finish this Sunday and si Dios quiere, like we'll say in Spanish, if God wills, next Sunday, finish with a series that we started about two months ago about covenants. So, in the next three to five minutes, I want to do a little uh, refresh on our brains and I'm going to repeat a few things throughout it because I believe repetition is very good for us. Uh, how become good at the stuff is by repeating, right? Uh, if you're going to learn anything, you have to repeat and repeat and repeat until it gets into your brain, until it gets into, uh, into your, uh, your system. Yeah? Can I adjust you? Yes. Thanks, Jeremiah. I actually was thinking this morning, I was like, uh, I don't know if Jeremiah will be there. I'm always thankful that you live it right. Yes, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so, the purpose of all this series about the covenants that we find in the Bible, I'm going to kind of uh, remind you a little bit of that, was to help us understand our God, to understand Dios, to understand Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever the name is that you know Him more, Abba, our Father, our Creator. Because the Bible at times can be a little confusing. Uh, we see... Or it seems that we see a, a little bit of a different side, or a, almost a bipolar God, when we look only at the Old Testament and then we look at, at the New Testament. So this series is to help us reconcile and to understand that God is the same throughout the whole Bible. He is the same. And one of the things that happens when we, when we saw the first uh, covenant is the covenant that God made with humankind at, in Eden, when he puts them in a perfect place, and when there is no need for sin, they sin. The covenant that God makes with them is for, for humankind to rule over the earth, to take control, to subdue, to multiply, to uh, rule in behalf of God. That's why the Bible says that He created us in His likeness, in His image, because His purpose was for, uh, for, uh, for humankind to be... Uh, um, a group of people that will bear his image in the earth. Okay? We get that, that clear? All right. So after that, every other covenant that God makes with humankind is a redemptive covenant. It's, some, it's something that God has in his plan. It's one step upon another one. Uh, so to get back to the beginning, to what the intention was. What was at the Eden? That you and me will live with God, we'll have communion with Him, we'll be enjoy uh, His presence, we will know who we really are, and after we know that, we will rule the earth in the way that He will do it. That is why you and me are here. That's why we are be, why we've been put in this planet, and many of the problems of the world are because they're being ruled by, we're being ruled by people who don't know who they are. They don't know that they've been made in the image of God and there is nothing that they have to prove. So people that live like that, they live for money, they live for power, and they live for themselves. And that creates all of the problems that we have today. So after that, we, see, we saw the, uh, the covenant that God makes with, uh, uh, with Noah, and then we saw the covenant that God made with Abraham. And we come today to the covenant that God makes uh, with, with, Mo with Moses. So one of the things that we also have to remind about these covenants, because I'm saying all of this, and it might be a little boring or a little hard to follow, but I'm really excited by the time that we get to the new covenant, because there is a lot of things that we see that Jesus does, that we know that Jesus did, or things that we see that are going to make much more sense if we first get all of these things a little bit in our head, a little bit if we, we know some basic stuff. So uh, 
when we get uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the covenant with Moses, we have to ask ourselves four questions in order to start understanding this. And the first one is, with whom was this covenant made? And the Bible uh, shows us that it was made with the nation of Israel. Then the other question comes, the, the two and the third come together, is when was the covenant made? And what was the relationship to the Abrahamic covenant? The covenant made with Abraham, where God promised Abraham, he gave his word, and he said that, in his descendants, all of the, the nations or the earth were going to be blessed. And we know the story of Abraham. He only has one child, and then is required by God to sacrifice that child. And then, if you know the story, he doesn't end up uh, sacrificing the child. So, in that story, what is the relationship with that covenant? And we find the answer to these two things in Galatians 3, 15 to 20. And it says like this. Beloved friends, let me use an illustration that we can all understand. Technically, when a contract is signed, it can be changed after it has, been, it has been put into effect. It is too late to alter the agreement. Remember the royal proclamation God spoke over Abraham and to Abraham's child. In other versions, it says Abraham's offspring. It says, God said that his promise were made to pass on to Abraham's child no children because Abraham had more than one it says and who is this child is the son of the promise Christ himself this means that the covenant between God and Abraham was fulfilled in the Messiah in Jesus and cannot be altered yet the written law was not even given to Moses until 430 years after God has signed the contract with Abraham the law then doesn't supersede the promise since the royal proclamation was given before the law. If that were the case, it would have been fulfilled what God said to Abraham. We receive all of the promises because of the promised one, not because we keep the law. And I am thankful for that because if I, it was for me to receive all the promises according to my faithfulness, I would be doomed. But he is faithful. And that was one of the things that we saw, I, I repeated in the other covenants. God is always the one who reveals the covenants, the ones that lays the conditions, and the ones that, he's the one that always keeps the covenant 100%. And if we can keep anything of the covenant, it's because he's given us all that we need in order to keep that covenant. Amen? It is his faithfulness. It's, and then, then a little bit more, it says, why then was the law given at all? It was given alongside with the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the seed, the child who was promised. When God gave uh, the law, he gave it first to angels, then he gave it to Moses, his mediator, who then gave it to the people. Now, a mediator does not represent just one party alone, but God fulfilled it all by himself. So now we see throughout all of this as, as we answer these questions that, so the, the question was, when was this covenant made? It was 430 years after the covenant with Abraham. And what is the relationship to the Abrahamic covenant? And we see that faith and righteousness are, all, are preceding the law. We see that Abraham, uh, Abraham's seed, uh, that we are Abraham's seed because we are in Jesus. Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And it says that... Um, the law didn't cancel this covenant with Abraham. They went both alongside. And wh where we can find this is if we read Hebrews 11, there is this, this part that is called the Hall of Faith. Where, or we call it like that because there is all this list of people that uh, the Bible says are, are, are there like a cloud of witnesses looking at us. And all these people, there are names in there of people that were not in the covenant with Moses, but that they live by faith and by obedience, and they are put among this group of people. Now, then the, the question number four is, that why was this covenant given? And it says here that when we read the scripture, we see that God delivers Israel 
from Egypt, not because Israel is faithful, but God delivers Israel from the slavery in Egypt because of the promise he had made to Abraham to fulfill the covenant with Abraham. So we, we can see that the covenant with Moses is not God taking Israel to a place, but is God taking Israel through a place. It's to take Israel through the wilderness into the promised land. Um, now we see that throughout 40 years, the Bible tells us that uh, the people of Israel were, were tested in the desert and Israel fails continually, but God keeps showing himself faithful. What the law uh, and the testing in the desert do is to show Israel's lack of trust, their lack of faith. One of the, if we read a little bit more, uh, if, you, if you read the story, if you know when all of the commandments are presented to Israel, Israel makes a oath and they swear, we are going to do and keep everything that the Lord said. But they didn't do it. They made a covenant, they said they were going to do something, and they didn't do it. But whatever God said he was going to do, whatever he promised, he kept, he did, he stood behind his word. So now, I'm going to quickly read all of these things so we can get, uh, get to the next thing. So a little bit of the things that I can find in scripture of the purpose of the law. Um, it says that it sets forth the divine standard of righteousness. Two, gives a clear external definition of sin. Three, shows uh, Israel, the exceeding sinfulness and the sinfulness of sin. For exposes to all men their guilt before God, that no one is righteous. Number five, it is the law it is to preserve the nation of Israel and the messianic line from corruption. Number six, it illustrates the two major ways that God deals with men. Number seven, provides a temporary atonement. And we'll see that in the new covenant about an everlasting, never-ending atonement. And number eight, it shows that no one can be justifi justified by the law, but by grace and faith. And number nine is to show that the law, the covenant of the law, could not give life. I have references in all of these things that I'm saying, so you can go and read it, that I'm just not making stuff up. Uh, if you want these notes, you can find it at diegosministry.com. No, I'm <laughs> teasing. No, at the end of the series, uh, you, I will give it to Christian. We can have it in the computer. You, you can get it. You can read. You can research. Maybe you will find things that you think they're wrong. We can talk about it later. We can have discussions about this. Okay? So now, we saw throughout all of the other uh, covenants that there are three main components. The words of the covenant, the blood of the covenant, and the seal of the covenant. And you may say, Diego, again with that thing. It is really important for, know, for us to know these things because we are going to see that in Jesus. The words of the covenant, the blood of the covenant, and the seal of the covenant. Within the words of the covenant, we see in the Mosaic law is the biggest one. It has over 600 commanded, commandments, and we find that in the Levitical Code. They're divided in three sections, so we can divide in three sections. The moral law, which are the Ten Commandments, the civil laws, and the ceremonial law. We also see in the words of the covenant that in this particular covenant, there is not an oath from God confirming this covenant, but there is an oath, like I previously said, from Israel, where they promise that they're going to keep this, and they don't do it. Now, in the terms, we find usually this word, if. And this speaks of a conditional clause in this covenant. And like the previous covenants, this one is not so focused on faith and obedience, but it's a little bit more towards uh, legal obedience. It's, it's founded on the basis of legal obedience. We find in these words the Ten Commandments. You guys have heard about the Ten Commandments? So the first four, they, they talk about the focus on our relationship of us with God. They're related to God. And the next six, six they kind of regulate the relationships between humans. It's kind of when Jesus came, he's like, they asked him, what, are the, uh, what, what is the, the, the greatest commandment? He said, love your God with all your might, with all your strength. And then he said, and the second one, it is love your neighbor. In these two, all of the law and the prophets 
are found. All, all of it is in this. And so we see that when we read the, the Ten Commandments, that is, is in two sections, our relationship with God and our relationship with, uh, with our neighbor. Also, we find in this, the promises that are in this, in this, uh, in this covenant are blessings and curses, and, and curses. We find that in Leviticus 25, all of the blessings, and, and all of the bad stuff we find in Leviticus 26. We have the book, which is the tablets. All of that we find those things in the words of the covenant. Now, let's jump to the blood of the covenant. In the blood of the covenant, we find a sacrifice. And in this, in all of the Bible, in the, in the uh, covenant with Moses, we see the Levitical offering, the voluntary offerings, grain offerings. The, the grain offerings acknowledge God as the source of blessing. And peace offerings are meals of friendship and fellowship. Then we have mandatory, mandatory offerings, sin offerings, which are sins against God, and guilt offerings, which are sins against others. We see again, first our relationship with God, then our relationship with our neighbor. Now, we find a lot of things throughout, uh, throughout this covenant. We, have, we find that the, uh, it stresses a lot that life is in the blood. The blood made the atonement for our soul. Because they needed to sacrifice animals in, or, in order to clean their, uh, to uh, cover their sins. And then we see also here the blood as the evidence of life being poured out. And this, the blood is also the evidence that judgment has been made on sin. That happens again with, with Jesus when we see the new covenant. Now, when we, when we read a lot about this, which I encourage you to read, I encourage you to read the whole Bible. Not only the New Testament, not only the Old Testament, read it all as one whole story, is that living with God is a life of sacrifice. I was talking with a couple of people this morning how we have turned Christianity into a matter of self-preservation. When the first thing that Jesus says is that in order to follow him, we have to lose our life. We have to lose who we are. So we see throughout all of this in here, again, it's kind of like a foreshadowing that life with God is a life of sacrifice, but it's a, worth, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sacrifice that is worthy to do. Now, in the blood of the, of the covenant, as it, we also find a mediator, somebody that had to do this, this covenant. And then in this one, the seal of, the, of this covenant is the Sabbath. And it's a sign between God and Israel. We can see that in Ezekiel 2012. And the reason for the Sabbath is for Israel to recognize that God is their source. We see in the Old Testament pictures of the Sabbath before this. We see, first of all, uh, when God rested. In the, in, in, after he created everything, he took a day, he rested from all the works. And we also see... Uh, when Israel is taken through the desert, the, the daily manna, they, they could take uh, manna every day, but um, they couldn't take too much. Whatever, whatever they, they took was going to be enough for that, for that day, for the, 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 the day of rest. Now, they are uh, giving Sabbath, uh, Sabbath days, which are one every, uh, the seventh day, and then we have Sabbath years, which are, according to the law, a rest for the land. And the Bible says that judgment was brought on Israel because they didn't keep the Sabbath. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus tells us that the Sabbath was made for men and not the other way around. Because when Jesus came, people uh, have turned the Sabbath into an idol. Something that could be very easy for us to do. God gives us something, not necessarily this other stuff, and we turn this thing that he gives us into an idol. Instead of, instead of focusing or, or, or we forget that the source of our deliverance was him, not whatever he gave us. So Jesus says that the Sabbath was made for men and not the other way around. Now we find in Acts 15 in the Jerusalem uh, council when um, Paul and Barnabas come to talk with all of the apostles and the elders of the church because now the Gentiles are receiving the Holy Spirit and, they, and there is a group that say they need to be circumcised in order to be saved. They have discussion and they say this, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us 
And then they list the things that the Gentiles needed to follow. It says that you abstain from uh, food sacrifice to idols, of, of strangle, and from sexual immorality. But they don't include the Sabbath. But we take a day of rest because we understand that there is a principle throughout the Bible. There is a principle that God is showing us that like just for Israel in the Old Testament, God is our source. When we decide to take a rest from working, even though we have things to pay and we have debt and we have things that we want to do, when we decide to rest, we are acknowledging that God is our source. He is the one that provides for us. So, in a little bit of a nutshell, in the New Testament, the Sabbath, it is a matter of spiritual freedom and not a command. It's not about keeping a day, but it's about receiving a person. Jesus is the rest of God. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, this is the covenant that they made with Israel. They go through the desert, and then right about before Israel enters into the promised land, God makes another covenant with Israel, or makes an extension of this one. And we find this in, um, in uh, Deuteronomy 20, uh, 29, 9, where it says, besides whatever was spoken to Moses, now God starts speaking um, um, what, what he spoke to Moses before, now he's going to give a couple more of rules, a couple uh, more of, uh, of commandments. And this covenant, we call it the Palestinian covenant. It's the covenant God made with Abraham before getting into the promised land. This covenant reaffirms and expands the, the, the Mosaic covenant. It helps to apply the Mosaic covenant as, um, as they step into the promised land. We, we see again uh, obedience, love for God, uh, rest for the land. We see that there is a note in this case attached to the curses. And then we see here, um, again, the blood of the covenant. It keeps following the pattern laid down in the Mosaic covenant. The mediator here is Eliezer, son of Aaron, chosen to be the high priest. And so we see here again the seal of the covenant, just as I mentioned the Sabbath. Now, it's not only the Sabbath day and Sabbath years, but now here the, the, in this covenant, the Bible talks about the early rain and the latter rain, where God promises an early rain and a latter rain. And when you say, well, what was the rain so important? But for, if you will be a little bit into farming, or the farmers know how the rain is important. And when your whole economy and your whole society is depending on what you grow and your crops, a uh, good rain in the right time and another rain in the right time are perfect, are very important. So God promises these things to Abraham, to uh, Moses before getting into the promised land. So now after that, we get into the covenant with David. Anybody lost, bored? I know I'm going fast, but I want to get to the... The good stuff, okay? So, like I said, if you get lost, you can get all the, all the notes later. And with more time, you can do this. So now, when we get to the covenant with David, we, we see that this covenant is an extension of the Abrahamic covenant. It's like it goes, uh, it goes uh, Abraham, we have Moses, then we have the Palestinian covenant before going into the promised land, and then we have David. And so some of, of the events that lead into these situations is that Israel, they are ready in the promised land, and they are a growing nation. They are they're established. Um, and we see here that the judges are there. God had put judges, and they function to preserve the covenant previously made. And the Bible tells us that everyone did as they thought it was right, because there was no king. And I've heard this preached many times, or taught many times, that one of the problems of Israel with God is that they wanted a king. The Bible says that Israel started looking at other nations and they wanted a king, and that God didn't want to give them a king. But that is not completely right. We find in the scripture things like, in the Bible says that a king shall come from Abraham. That Jacob blessed Judah and it says that the scepter shall not depart from him. 
So God had always wanted, and his plan there was always to give Israel a king, but not a king like the other nations. So when Israel complained, when they started that they wanted a king, well, God gave them Saul, which was a political leader was a person that if you read through his story, he only cared about what other people thought about him. When he disobeyed God and he kept some of the animals that God told them to kill, he goes and talks to the priest and after the, 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 um, the, the priest rebukes him for what he had done, he said, okay, whatever, but walk with me outside so the people think that I am good with God. So, God gave them Saul because that's the kind of kid that they wanted. But he all along had a king prepared for them, which was David. The name David means the beloved, the one that is loved. And David was, the Bible says, a man after God's own heart. When David sinned, probably even worse than Saul, because he killed somebody, he probably rapes a woman because the woman didn't have an option because he was the king. What David does, David goes and says, Lord, I have sinned against you. He never cared about the people. He never cared about the kingdom. He said, Lord, I sinned against you, so please don't take your spirit from me. David knew that the most important thing in his life was not his kingdom of the people. It was his relationship with his creator. And that is the kind of king that God had, had prepared for Israel. So, uh, God makes a covenant with David, and he promises a, a lot of things. He promises a ruling dynasty. He promised David that in the throne of Israel, there will always be somebody of his blood sitting on the throne. And after Solomon, uh, the kingdom uh, splits in two, and in Judah... In the kingdom of Judah, we will always find an unbroken dynasty of the Davidic line sitting upon the throne from Solomon to Zedekiah. Now, the second one is that God promises a messianic seed to him. We'll see that in Jesus. That's why they call Jesus son of David. Uh, we, we find in scripture that Jesus to David, he is both. He is David's Lord in his divinity, but he's also David's son in his humanity. Uh, another promise to, uh, to David is that he promised mercies upon David. The number four is that he promised dominion over the lands and over his enemies. The number five is the temple. God promised David because he wanted to build the temple. He's like, here I'm living in this palace and the, and the, and the ark of the Lord is in a tent and, and he expresses that to the priest, and the priest is like, yeah, the Lord is with you, go ahead and do it. But that night, the Lord spoke to the priest, and he sends a message to David. And he's like, you're not going to do it. You were a shepherd, I take you out of, out of taking care of sheep, I took you from victory to victory, I made you a king, I gave you this and this, but you are not going to do that. But your children will do it, your son will do it. And I love that because that is one of the things that, that, that reminds me of the faithfulness of God. That even though there are things that I believe and that I want, I might not see in my lifetime, but I have the assurance that my, my children will carry it on. Or that my grandchild will do it. There is probably things that you are doing right now that somebody 150 years ago prayed for. There are moments and there are things in, in our life that we are experiencing today that generations before pray and they work and they sacrifice your life so that you and me can enjoy it. And because God is a generational God. One of the things that God has told me in the, in the, in the, in the later years is that I have to, me, every dream that I have, I have to take it through the filter of, is this dream for my lifetime or is this dream for the next generation? Because every promise and every covenant that God made was never for a man to enjoy in his lifetime, but it was for three, four generations. When God made a, pro, a, 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 a covenant with Abraham, it was to bless future generations. So, it, it, uh, God tells um, David that he was going, that his son was going to build the temple. 
And the terms in here are faith and obedience. There is a note confirmed by God. You can find it in Psalms 89, 3 and 5, and 27 to 35. There is a note where God confirms his covenant with David. We now go to the blood of the covenant. This sacrifice in the blood of the covenant, David offers burnt and peace offerings. And David show us a little bit more of the spiritual sacrifice because David represents a new system, a new spiritual type of praise, thanksgiving, and a heart of sacrifice. He is, in this case, a king and priest. There was a priest at the time, and he was a king. But we see throughout the scriptures that David does a lot of things. He, he, he got away with a lot of things that nobody else got away. David did some things that other people did and they got killed for. But because of some mysterious thing going on in the relationship between him and God, he got away with it. Because he was a man after God's own heart. He, he, the, we find in the Bible in Samuel and in Chronicles that uh, David wore priestly garments. That was only for the priest. But he got away with it. He offered a sacrifice before the Lord. That only the priest will do. He offered, uh, uh, he uh, proclaimed a blessing upon the people in the name of the Lord. And David set up a tabernacle and placed the Ark of the Covenant in it. And the sanctuary is the tabernacle of David. Characterized by praise and worship. And the Bible says that God was going to restore the tabernacle of David. And we are going to see more of that. Later, So we see here a little bit of the contrast when we read about David, how he gets away with doing all of these things. And he has this sort of revelation. And, 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 and David writes, and we have most of the Psalms are, are written by, by David. And we, saw, we, um, we read or, or we memorize Psalms uh, 23. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you. Who knows that one? Psalm 23. It says like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall, not lack, I shall lack nothing. He makes me lay down in green. He, had, uh, he le uh, leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley uh, uh, through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. The other version, you know, wanted to come in. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow and death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all of the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David knew something about God in a lesser covenant than the one that we have now. Because the covenant that we're going to see next Sunday, the covenant with Jesus, is so much better than any other covenant ever made. We have a priest that went one time and sacrificed himself and shed his blood, not only to cover our sins, but to remove our sins. And he did it only one time. In these covenants, before we see it, that the people needed to sacrifice every year. And they still had to live with the guilt of their sins. And maybe you don't know this, but you don't have to live with guilt or shame. When people try to get you to do stuff by putting guilt and shame on you, don't take it. That's not the voice of God. That is manipulation. God never tells you or moves you to do something by guilt and shame. That is not the way he works. He died so that you will be free from guilt and shame. And somehow in this, David knew it. When you read about, about all of these things that, that David writes in the Psalms, he's often destroyed and being persecuted and about to be killed. He always finds a refuge on knowing that God has not rejected him. We, we see a lot of these things today uh, as a, as a, in the spiritual side. 
Psalms 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my, the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, and my enemies and my foes um, who will stumble and fall, thought, uh, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me, and even then I will be confident. And I read this to myself, for we read these things when we can pay a debt. When somebody is speaking bad about us. When somebody writes junk about us on social media. But David was in a real war. When he says here, even he said, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. He was physically surrounded by people that wanted to cut him into pieces. They wanted his head. And he found a confidence in the middle of that that I still need to find. That I'm not there yet. Maybe because I haven't been persecuted like he was. So we see in the way that he, in the relationship that he had with God, almost, not quite, but almost at times surpassing or getting away with things that were outside of the law. And now, I'm not saying that that's what he did, but it, it's what it seems at times. Um, now, in this covenant, God gave um, David a seal, a signature, something like saying, here, this is the sign that as long as this is there, I will keep my, co my covenant with you. And if you remember a little bit, when I was going through all the covenants before, there is, a, there is a, a specific thing that happens, a little change in the covenant with Abraham. Is that until Abraham, the covenants were, were done with humankind. The covenant was with Adam and Eve was for humankind. The covenant when they fall and it's done, um, it's done with, um, when, when, they, when, they, when, yeah, when they fall, when they sin, and he, he does with, um, with Adam and Eve again, and he tells them, well, now you're going to have to work and, and sweat, and thorns are going to grow. It's again, it's a curse for the entire globe. When it comes to no, uh, for Noah, the covenant with Noah, it's again, it's a covenant with the whole humanity. But when it comes to Abraham, it changes, and now the covenant is with one man. And now in a future, things are going to be for all the earth again. But one of the things that we see with Noah is that there is a sign, there is a, a seal of his covenant, which is the rainbow. The Bible says that the rainbow was going to be a sign that as long as that was there, he wasn't going to destroy the earth or like he wasn't going to flood the earth again. So now we see in the covenant with with David, so we understand how big this is, because David is not Jesus. But what kind of relationship and commitment this man had, what kind of revelation of the heart of God he had, that in Psalms 89, 34, 37 says like this, how could I revoke my covenant of love? Important word in there, that I promised David. For I have given him my word, my holy, irrevocable word. How could I lie to my loving servant David? Sons of David will continue to reign on his throne. And their kingdom will endure as long as the sun is in the sky. This covenant will be, unbreak, will be an unbreakable promise that I have established for all time. Salah. How important... The revelation of God to us is beyond anything else. What kind of relationship David had, what kind of knowledge David had in, in, a, in, in a covenant where his, his, his sin wasn't removed from his life. His sin was only covered by a sacrifice. Yet, he wrote most of the Psalms, the ones that you and me read, the ones that you and me take as comfort, the ones that you and me take as a promise, and the, the ones that you and me take as God speaking to us. Written by a man on a lesser covenant. How much more you and me 
can do in God if we barely grasp the size of the covenant that we have with Christ. Because David was a foreshadowing of the Messiah. There was a lot of things that we can find in David that we can find in Jesus later. But he was not the son of God. He was not God himself. When David died, he wasn't, the Bible doesn't say that, uh, that God was, with, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It was Jesus. So out of all that, we, that we've seen today, a couple of things again to, to, to remind us is that our God is a God of covenants. And a lot of what we are going to know about him, a lot of what we are going to receive from him, not on the basis of work, but in the basis of inheritance, depends on a response to, their, to his covenant. Because he lays out the covenants and he does, he, he keeps it, he's faithful, but our response is also required. There is a part of us that the, the, there is a little bit that we need to do. Sometimes we think that there is a lot that we do and it's really not that much. Because it's ba uh, most of the things are upon, uh, they, they, are, they hang on his mercy and in his faithfulness. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And if we were, we were going to be judged without mercy, we will be doomed. But his mercy triumphs over judgment. And also the Bible says that um, don't, don't, be, don't be a fool because can, God can be mocked. Whatever a man so, uh, sows, he will also reap. But if I, if I personally was going to reap everything I've sown, I wouldn't be here today. So his mercy and his faithfulness and his love and his power is the one that takes us beyond our ability to keep the covenant. So remember that. It is him. He is the one that lays the conditions on how we relate to him. We don't get to say how we have a relationship with him. Right now, this is very important for you to know and for everybody that is probably 20 or less. Because there is a very strong demonic work trying to tell us that we can change God to our own image. I've heard this before saying, God made us into his image and then we return him this, the favor and we made it into our image. That is not how it works. If God says that you're a man, you're a man. You cannot change your gender, just so that is clear. If God says who you are, that is who you are, not other people. The ones that, that, that identifies who we are is Jesus, is our Father. And if we don't know who we are, we need to go around to him and ask him, okay, who am I? What am I here for? What am I supposed to do? Why, why do I feel like I've been wasting my life for the, for the last 50 years and I'm getting nowhere? He is the one that lays the conditions on how we relate to him. Not all, all beliefs lead to God. If you want to know how the creator of the universe is, look at Jesus. Because he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if you go into any other religion out there, you will see that all of the ones who proclaim they are God, they're all dead. But Jesus is alive. My Jesus is alive. How do I know that? Because I don't see it on a physical form. Well, he has made me alive when I was dead. Now, as we step next Sunday into the, uh, the new covenant, the covenant that you and me are, are part of, the covenant with Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, I will encourage you to... If you took some notes, try to uh, remember a couple of things of all the ones that I said, just as the words of the covenant, the blood of the covenant, and the seal of the covenant, because those things are going to be really important to understand whatever comes next. So this is, this is I'm through, uh, I'm done, but this is what I, I want to uh, tell you today. Whatever you find in the Bible, 
remember, your covenant with God is a blessing. I was uh, confronted with something the other day. And, 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 the, and the Holy Spirit is been showing me different stuff and it showed me this. It's, it's very easy for us to focus on our own sins and our own shortcomings. Like one of the um, preachers that I listen to, we have a sin consciousness. We think constantly of how far we are from God. We think on our own sins. We have one problem and we focus on one problem. Well, if I could change this in my behavior, if I could change this in my life, then everything would be better. So that happens and we switch and then we realize that there is a whole lot of other things that we need to change. But we've been taught and we've been, uh, we've been pushing our head this sin consciousness, this idea that you and me have been born corrupted, have been born into the curse, into a broken world, that by nature we tend to be evil, we tend to be selfish. And that comes through the nature of Adam, because Adam fell, sin entered the world, and that came to us. But through one man, sin entered into the world, and through one man, now salvation and a new uh, rebirth of who we are is possible. And it's through Jesus. And we need to make a switch in our heads about on what we spend most of the time thinking. If we keep thinking that we are sinners saved by grace, or we are finally be able to embrace that the Bible also says that we are saints, that we've been born again, that we're redeemed, that we are the child of God, that we are the children of God, that we are the light of the world, a light that cannot be hidden. Think about that, and we will see more about that on Sunday. Amen? So I hope I didn't bore you. I didn't get, uh, you didn't get too lost. I hope you're blessed about because this blesses me. Because these are the promises of God. Of the same God that has been throughout history. That it was, that it is, and the one that it is to come. Amen? So if Jesus doesn't come before, we will, we will finish this uh, on next Sunday. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for... I thank you for what you have uh, left us uh, in the Bible, for all of these truths, and, and because you invite us to know you more, and because uh, you keep us in the mystery of knowing you more, you keep us in the chase, in, uh, you keep us with hunger or, or trying to know on the curiosity of the mystery of who you are, a mystery that is predestined to be Reveal to be encountered because at the same time though you, you we, we have to work we have to uh, we have to uh, to read and, and to set time apart to to know you you are right there and you are in the everyday life you are our father you are in every part of our life in the most uh, things that we in the things that, that we think that might be most significant there you are in the valley in the mountain during the times that things are good, or in the times that, uh, that things are not so good. Father, you are like that perfect husband that is with us through sickness and through health, through moments of, uh, of lack and through riches. Father, and I thank you for that. I thank you for your faithfulness because you are faithful to me even when I am not. Father, keep through your spirit, keep speaking to our hearts and to our minds as we Next Sunday, step into, uh, into the next covenant. Uh, I bless uh, your church. I bless my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I think Albert had an announcement. Okay, thank you, Pastor Diego. It was a good word. I'm eager for next Sunday. Um, a couple things to announce. Uh, one is we will have a special offering next Sunday for uh, Kevin Buchert. Uh, most of us know him by face. 
Um, he had a medical emergency years ago and is still in a series of corrections since, and he needs to do a procedure coming up shortly, and we want to bless him as a church with taking up an offering to uh, cover, help cover those medical expenses that he will have shortly. Uh, we'll take up an offering next Sunday. So we'll have two offerings next Sunday, one for the regular tithes and another one for Kevin. Another one is, as we heard in the announcements, marriage seminar coming up. I'll need to check with Shirley if we have already signed up. We're planning to come, so if you'll come, you'll join us here. Then the third one, we're planning to have a baptism in June. June 5th is the date that we have set for a baptism. So if you are uh, wanting to be baptized, uh, please uh, approach myself or one of the other elders, and we'll get you on the list for, for that. If you could uh, do that in the next few weeks would be great so we can plan to have a class preceding that. Thank you very much. God bless you and have a wonderful week. This is a song I wrote with my good friend Aaron Schust. A raging storm, the one who walks upon the sea, earth and heaven are your own, yet you're watching over me. How majestic is your name, cause there is none like. 